Okay, this audio isn't going to match the video mouth because I need to think out loud and I need to walk when I do it so I can't show my face and stand in one place. It's about this whole thing regarding what was said to David about, well, you're a man of blood and therefore you're not going to build my house. To the average Christian today, who doesn't look at things in context, that sounds like a punishment. That sounds like God is disciplining David for having gone to war. And we all see it that way when we look at it out of context and we don't think it over. So let's do some thinking over, okay? I'm not going to exactly tell you the whole of the answer because I actually have to think about it more myself. But a lot of the answer, I think, is really kind of clear and we just need to walk through it. First of all, the pages and the passages that are relevant to this question, um, directly relevant, because the whole Bible is relevant to it, the direct passage re passages relevant are in the video description. I'm not going to reference the exact verses in there because I want to talk about the passages as a whole. Let's, let's get back to where the context is of what happened there. We have to go back to Samuel in order to know that context. The context was that Israel was under the judges. She was under the judges because she was apostate. She was under the judges because Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. That's a quote out of the Song of Moses, um, Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 says some positive things about Israel and some negative things about Israel. It is a prophecy. It's metered. I haven't metered it out yet. But what Moses is following up on Psalm 90. He wrote Deuteronomy 32 just after Psalm 90. And he's giving them a prophecy about the time of the judges and how that particular thing in Deuteronomy 32 is going to characterize Israel's whole future. Okay? He's warning them in advance that they are going to reject God as king in what we call 1050 B.C. That's the background. All of that stuff came true, and that's why you have the book of Judges. It ends with Samuel. They are so apostate at the time that Samuel is born that his mother, Hannah, who Mary will be quoting in the Magnificat, his mother brings him into the temple to be a priest. That's how apostate they are. He was not eligible to be a priest. He's from Ephraim. He's the wrong tribe. And you know what? The little boy sleeps in the Holy of Holies. He sleeps right next to the ark where only the high priest was allowed to go. The high priest, Eli, he was so corrupt that he was just letting his sons get away with murder. They were literally getting away with stealing the, the offerings from the people. The corruption in the book of Judges is vast. It's a very bad time. Okay? So that's the background. Out of this comes Samuel. He's a little kid when he gets started. But he grows to be a really strong believer. And notice, this is real important to the story. Samuel is of the wrong tribe, but the right belief. And so God lets him be a prophet. He is not a priest. He is a prophet, a wandering prophet. Prophet meant teacher. A teacher with a special gift, not necessarily a fore foretelling. A special gift of knowing what was going to become scripture. And of course, you know, that's why you've got Samuel, the book of Samuel written. 
Okay, whether Samuel himself wrote it or not, I'm not sure. But the point is, it's about Samuel. It's about Samuel and his times. He was the last of the judges, in a sense. He was really the sort of transition between the judges as a prophet. The last of the judges was Samson. Now, as a result of that apostasy being so bad, I'm sorry the lead-in is so long, but if you don't know the background, you're going to misinterpret what God said to David when he talked about man of blood. The apostasy was so bad that Israel came to want to be just like everybody else. Yeah, because the law is nothing like heathen religion. The law makes fun of heathen religion. It uses some of the same surface appearances, but the meaning is entirely different. God's making fun of, and this is really important, he's making fun of sacrifices that humans do. He's making fun of your hard efforts and your hard works to appease the God. Hey, honey, I'm already perfect as God. I don't need your help. That's what all those sacrifices depicted. They were in your face. God's going to do the work. You ain't doing nothing. It was what God was going to do for you. They all depicted Christ's future coming. Okay? In other words, everything in the Mosaic Law was shot through with irony. Just like the irony of little baby Samuel with his little ephod that his mommy made and brought him once a year. Sleeping in the Holy of Holies where only the high priest of the Levites was supposed to go. Once a year at that. In other words, how come Samuel didn't get killed? You see the point? Shot through with irony. So whenever you, you look at the law and you look at the pagan culture, you realize very quickly, if you're paying attention, that the Mosaic Law is a satire on pagan religion. It is a very tongue-in-cheek idea. Hi, I sin, so I get dinner. Hi, I sin, so now I get to eat meat, which in the ancient world was a big luxury. The more I sin, the more meat I get. The more, the more I sin, the more rich food I get. Yeah, I have to pay for it, but God has to give me the money. Because he knows I'm going to sin in advance. Okay, so God, God's making me rich so I can sin and therefore have the money in order to buy the animal, in order to take it to the priest. And by the way, I get some, he gets some, and we have dinner together. I'm sorry, but that's politically incorrect. Very ironic. That's the law. Samuel is living that life of political incorrectness. He's running around on a circuit instead of staying still, teaching the people what he knows, you know, from the law that had already been written down by Moses. At the end of a very long apostasy period, and what does Israel do in response? We want a king just like everybody else. We don't want God as our king anymore. Uh oh. Well, if they don't want God as their king anymore, well then, that's the end. Divorce. So God goes to Samuel, who's now an old man, and says, you know what? I'm going to listen to the people. I'm going to listen to the people now. Here's this guy, his name is Saul, he's the son of Kish, go and anoint him, he's going to be their king. Now Saul was a head taller than everybody else. That's what distinguished him. And in the day that he was anointed, he was a pretty, you know, humble guy. But he was taller than everybody else, so everybody could look up to him. Yeah. And so when he found out about it, he hid amongst the baggage. And he waxed hot and cold about it. A couple of years went by and 
Then there was this problem with the Philistines and some of the other people in the surrounding territory, most of them Greeks. And the Lord wanted them to go to battle. First time they fought, it didn't work out too good. Second time they fought, Saul won. He got a little cocky. Before he went to battle, he was told by Samuel, kill them all. Spare nothing. I mean, you can read all this in Samuel. I'm just trying to summarize the story so you see the backdrop. Kill them all. Kill everybody. Make a note of that point. God is telling Saul to kill every man, woman, child, and beast. Even the beasts. The idea there, you have to know something about the culture in the ancient world. There's no profit taking. If they kill them all, they can't get any economic benefit from them. So they're not doing it in order to make money. They're doing it because they're ordered to do it by this real God who really brought them out of Egypt. The same God who's now, there's this human king that's representing that God, but you know what? It's still God who's king indirectly. That was why he was ordered to do it. That's why Israel was ordered to do it all the time. You read all these stories yourself. I'm just trying to summarize it. Well, Saul didn't want to do that. Saul spared the king and some other people. I think his name was Agag who would become the progenitor of Haman, supposedly. That's in Purim in 474 B.C. later on, about a thousand years later on. Oh no, not even a thousand, much less. The point is, Saul did not obey what God, through Samuel, told Saul to do. Kill everything. Show that there's no profit-taking. This is a punishment from God, not profit-taking. Samuel did, Saul didn't do that. He took some of the animals and he started to do his own sacrificing because Samuel didn't show up in time. Oh, so now Saul's going to be a priest too? Uh-uh. The Levitical priesthood was not the same as the house of Judah, and Saul wasn't even from the house of Judah. He was from the, Saul, the tribe of Benjamin. So he's doing sacrifices he's not supposed to do with animals who aren't supposed to be alive, and there are some people being spared. So Samuel comes, like, I want to say four hours late, four days late, something like that. You can all read about it all in Second Samuel, First and Second Samuel. First Samuel, around chapter 13, somewhere in there, thir 7 through 13, something like that. Samuel says to Saul when he shows up, What's this noise of bleeding I hear in my ears? Uh, why, why is there livestock alive? Saul makes this excuse. Well, I needed them for the sacrifice. Of course, Saul was already sacrificing what he shouldn't have been doing. Samuel says to him, How come you spared the king? Why didn't you kill him? Saul makes this excuse and that excuse and la di la. Samuel says, Bring him here right now. And then Samuel killed him. The prophet Samuel slew the king right then and right there. Hmm. Doesn't sound like a whole lot of peace. Just slew the king. The king had already surrendered. He was already there. He had already was paying tribute the whole bit. You know, it's gratuitous. Just kill him. That's the story. You can read it in the Bible yourself. I'm just summarizing. And then Samuel turned away from Saul. And as he turned away from Saul, Saul grabs at Samuel's cloak, and some of the cloak tears off. So Samuel turns around and says to him, Even as you tore my cloak, so Israel will be torn from you and given to somebody else. 
that somebody else was David. And you all know the story. David was a teenager at the time, and he's the seventh son, and nobody likes him in the family, and so they send him out to the sheep, and that's where he gets to learn a lot of what was revealed then as Bible, so he can be alone and study with the smelly sheep. And uh, God knocks on Samuel Saul one day and says, Look, saddle up. I want you going out to see Jesse, whose great, you know, whose what? Father was uh, Obaid, and mother was Ruth, who was a Moabitess. Go out there, and he's got a bunch of sons, and I want to anoint one of them as king. Samuel says, oh, really? I kind of remember them. Well, which one? I'll tell you when you get there. So he goes there, and he's all impressed. You know, whoa, Eliab, whoa, look at that. Look at this son. Look at that. Oh, they're really fine. Oh, surely the Lord means this. Nope, not that one. He gets to the end of the six sons, and the Lord hasn't told him to anoint any of them. So Samuel turns to Jesse and says, Do you have any other sons? And Jesse said, Well, yeah, David. And, you know, he's with the sheep. God says to Samuel, That's the guy. Samuel says to Jesse, Well, you better go get him. And David, the youngest son, who by rights should not have gotten it, because that, that was a culture of primogeniture. The youngest son is anointed king when he's a teenager. And as soon as he's anointed king, he goes back and he tends the sheep. Then about, oh, I don't know, a year or so later, the sons were, of course, in the military with Saul, and Saul is camped against the Philistines, and they had this Greek practice of one soldier fighting another soldier so all the soldiers don't have to die. And there was this big loudmouth guy called Goliath who had four brothers, four or five, I forget which. And he'd come down into the valley every day and shout a challenge for somebody in Israel to go fight him and the winner would win the entire other country. Israel just sat there. Saul just sat there quaking in his boots. Meanwhile, Jesse, old boy, wanted to kind of get in good with the quartermaster, and so he loads David up with a bunch of provisions and says, you know, go, to, go on down there. Go down there and take this stuff to your brothers and, you know, give some to the quartermaster. David does. And, of course, as he gets there, it's like he hears the shouting of Goliath of Gath. Who will come out to challenge me? You guys are cowards. You've lost already. What, you can't one-on-one? -on -one, you can't even fight? David, the teenager redhead, says, uh, who, who's, who's this to challenge the armies of the living God, huh? Nobody else in Israel had said that. In fact, his brother says, oh, you little snot-nosed kid, who the heck do you think you are? And David just does his job, drops off his provisions, goes out, gets permission from Saul to go out against this Goliath person. Saul's kind of like, oh, yeah, right, uh-huh. Hey, uh, why don't you try on some of my armor? Well, no, that's too heavy for me, sir. Besides, I killed a lion and a bear with my slingshot. I'll do that. So he goes out. On his way out, he finds five, not one, but five smooth stones, because there are four other brothers. And it's a twirling slingshot. It's not a slingshot like we think of in the West. It's something you twirl. And he comes at Goliath with a dead run. Of course, they're yelling at each other, and meanwhile, he comes running at Goliath at a dead run, twirls his slingshot, and bam, hits Goliath right in the soft spot, the one place where a Philistine helmet between the eyes is open, dead on. I mean, it's, think of a diamond at the corner where your, your nose 
and your um, your nose and your forehead join. If somebody hits you really hard there, you can be knocked out or even die. Well, that's what's what happened? Goliath was knocked out, and then David pulls that big guy's sword from his, you know, scabbard, and he cuts his head off with it. As a result, Saul's all impressed. Israel's all impressed. Saul says, "Hmm, you know, well, let's put this guy in the army. You know, he'll give, he'll be good for morale." So he did. And David, you know, prospered because he was a fighter. In fact, he fought so much and so well that Saul thought, hmm, you know what? I think I better make him my son-in-law. But he was also kind of jealous because the people were starting to say that Saul has slew his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Saul thought, hmm, well, you know what? I can kill two birds with one stone. Let's have him kill a bunch of Philistines in order to get my daughter as his bride. And uh, if he happens to get killed in the process, that's not too bad. And I want to say, but I, you know, I'm talking from memory here because my computer's in the middle of a backup. I want to say that Saul told David that the price was 500 or or 1000 Foreskins. That means you have to kill that many and circumcise that many dead people and bring them all back in a bag to prove that you did that. David said, okay, that's a good bride price. Now, the reason why they picked that is because that was something that related to what happened between Sapora and Moses on their way back when Moses was on his way back to Egypt, but that's a long side story point is that David said yeah and then he and a few of his friends went out and slew twice as many Philistines as Saul asked for so David got Saul's daughter in marriage and he kept on prospering in fighting fighting and training fighting and training fighting and training that's what he did. 